Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 12842 in the name of Richard Leonard on NHS's 70th birthday. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Richard Leonard to open the de debate. Mr Leonard, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, as we celebrate and reflect on this debate today to mark the 70 years of the National Health Service, let us remind ourselves of the vision for a healthy nation, first outlined in Labour's 1945 manifesto. It read, by good food and good homes, much avoidable ill health can be prevented. In addition, the, be the best health services should be available free for all. Money must be no longer the passport to the best treatment. In the new National Health Service, there should be health centres where the people may get the best that modern science can offer. More and better hospitals and proper conditions for our doctors and nurses. Yet today, as in 1945, health inequalities, that glaring flaw in our society, continue to persist which is precisely why tackling poverty and inequality in Scotland and so the health inequalities which result should be the first priority of this Parliament. Poverty is a moral issue. It does not simply diminish the lives of those people caught up in it. It diminishes us all. It holds us back as a country. It weakens our society and hinders our economy. It is the cause of much preventable ill health, which is why we cannot carry on as we are with poverty deepening and inequality widening. I want to pay tribute today to all of the staff who work so hard to keep our NHS going, day in and day out, night in and night out, caring for and curing our sick. They deserve better support than they are getting from this government. But it is not just NHS staff who are being let down. It is NHS patients too, patients waiting hours for an ambulance despite repeated 999 calls and then hours on a trolley in a hospital corridor, many of them elderly, often with underlying health conditions. It's true that we have at long last been able to secure an independent inquiry into mental health services in Tayside but it should not take questions to the First Minister and families marching into this Parliament demanding justice for action to be taken. It is the Labour Party which founded the National Health Service and it is often overlooked that when Labour's Tom Johnston was appointed Secretary of State for Scotland in the wartime cabinet in 1941, it was Tom Johnston who began an experiment in the Clyde Basin of using civil defence hospitals set up to treat civilian war casualties to treat war workers who otherwise could not afford specialist diagnosis and treatment. And he rolled it out across Scotland. And in so doing, it drove down hospital waiting lists by 34,000. It helped form the basis for the 1944 White Paper and it blazed the trail for the National Health Service of the post-war years. And down the years, it, was, it has always been Labour governments which have invested in our NHS. When Labour was last in power, spending on the National Health Service in Scotland doubled, not merely in cash terms, but in real terms. We scrapped the internal market and we took the HCI private hospital in Clyde Bank, which the Tories had used public money to establish and put it into the National Health Service. And in the future, we will put before the people the clear choice. A decade of austerity and public expenditure cuts with the SNP and the Tories, or a decade of real and sustainable investment with Labour. So as we celebrate 70 years of the National Health Service, we recall its pioneers in the Labour Party. We reflect on its transformative achievements, and we once again renew our commitment to an NHS that is free at the point of use, to an NHS that is fully funded and fully resourced to an NHS that values its staff and serves its patients and to an NHS that works for the many, not the few. Because the NHS 
is practical socialism in action. Pure socialism, as Bevan described it. And that, in the end, is the Labour Party's defining idea. The heralding of the NHS 70 years ago meant the end of insurance stamps, the means test and endless queues. Medical care was no longer connected to ability to pay. General practitioners stopped having to compete for business and joined forces as part of a medical team. It became a single service and a national service. Commercial principles were replaced with collective action and public initiative. And so it is a powerful and an enduring idea which we will defend with every sinew in our bodies. But it is a powerful and enduring idea which should not simply be limited in its application to our National Health Service, but would be well applied in responding to growing demands to provide care for the elderly, where we are seeing commercial principles and a market-based approach pulling us into a crisis, and to social care, so that we can support the human rights of disabled people, remove the profit motive, and pay carers a proper rate of pay. In the field of public transport too, and in the provision of energy supply and distribution in housing, the possibilities are limitless. In 2018, it is time that we started to learn the lessons of 1948. The National Health Service was created when the country was almost bankrupt. It's time that we started to think big and act radically. It's time that we recaptured the spirit of that 1945 government. And it's time that we once again applied those enduring and timeless principles to our times. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Leonard. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And let me, let me start by uh, paying tribute to things the Labour Party have done. That's not a natural thing you would expect me to do. But I think in the last 100 years, uh, the legislation they brought forward to establish the National Health Service is the most significant and enduring thing that we should all commend. And in this Parliament, I have in the past, and I do again today, I commend Jack McConnell for his political courage in bringing forward legislation on smoking. So the Labour Party are capable of getting things right. But in this debate and the contribution made so far, I have to draw one or two different conclusions uh, from those uh, that we've just heard. First of all, uh, let me just uh, remind uh, the Labour benches that in fact, it's really the story of the National Health Service starts with the Highland and Islands Health Service, which was established in 1913 and covered half of Scotland's landmass. It was not free at the point of supply, but it set the limit as to what people paid, very low, so for the first time the ordinary working man and woman had access to health service. And in rolling out in 1944, uh, in the 1940s as Beveridge did, he was actually drawing on that model. So the, the roots that have got us to where we are are more diverse than perhaps just the simple uh, idea that it, that it was, was Beveridge. None the worse of any of that. I have to say, uh, absolutely do say. And indeed, the quote from Nye Bevan in the, uh, in, the, um, in, in the motion is one I agree with. I'm going to do what I did in the last health debate. I went again to the carers' comments website, and they're all from the last week, because it is not all gloom and doom. Uh, this is Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes September 27. The support of the whole by diabetic team, David Anderson building ARI, has been incredible. And then play service, uh, and this is at Aberdeen Children's Hospital. I think the play service is a really valuable service that makes children, helps children make the hospital seem less scary. And then my son's three and a half week stay at the Royal Aberdeen Children's Hospital. My son broke his femur at two and a half years old and was in traction for three and a half weeks. Now listen to this. My son really enjoyed his time. 
with the play staff who made his stay very enjoyable. This is someone in traction with a broken femur. Uh, that's how good the hospital was. And at Dr. Gray's maternity, um, uh, my grandchild was born in August 27, uh, 2017, had to stay in the unit for 10 days. The care that was given to both my daughter and grandchild was exceptional. Now that tells a lot about the staff in the health service. That absolutely exact, because that's frontline experience. But it also tells us about the system that supports the staff. And I'll just conclude, uh, presiding officer, with a comparison of the world before then, because of course, I was born before the health service. I have here a copy of a medical bill that my mother had to pay. Because a year before I was born, she had an ectopic pregnancy, a pregnancy in the fallopian tube, she had to go to hospital, have that fallopian tube removed, a very serious operation. And fortunately, it was done with such skill that she was then able to give birth to me, her first live birth, and two subsequent children. But the point is, the amount of money that's on this bill is three and a half weeks of the average working man or woman's wage at that time. She was fortunate to come from a family that could afford that. The health service was something that made it possible for that quality of service my mother was able, fortunately, to pay for, to be available to all. And I congratulate the health service on its upcoming 70th birthday. We are all grateful for its enduring uh, contribution to our society. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs, the father Anna Sarver. Mr Briggs, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, and I wanted to start by paying tribute to the former Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health and Sport as she has announced her intention to leave uh, the Scottish Government. We may have had our many disagreements across this chamber on health policy, but I've never doubted Shona Robson's commitment to trying to improve the health and well-being of our nation. And I've seen, uh, and all of us have seen, actually, how former Cabinet Secretaries for Health and Sport, once they've left the Government, uh, require and acquire a new independent lease of life. So I hope uh, the Cabinet Secretary um, will take that forward as well in the coming uh, weeks to hold, hold the Government to account on the back benches. And I'd like to start by congratulating uh, Richard Leonard on securing today's important debate, and I'm pleased to take part in it. I want to begin by putting on record my sincere thanks to all those who currently work, who, who have worked in our NHS, from the GPs, surgeons, to consultants, to nurses, to midwives, health visitors, hospital porters, ambulance drivers, paramedics, hospital cleaners, auxiliary staff, and so, so many more. Each and every day, thousands of our NHS workers in Lothian and across Scotland go above and beyond the call of duty to provide our constituents with some of the very best health care anywhere in the world. And we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. And as we celebrate the 70th birthday of our NHS, it's right that we thank NHS staff. And that is a key part of this celebration. Because any organisation is at its heart, its people. And the NHS is no different. I'm lucky enough in my job as Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Health to meet with NHS professionals on a daily basis. Most of my meetings will focus on challenges facing our NHS and the increasing demands which are being placed on Scotland's health and social care services. But often, more than not, they are about people and lives which have been saved. They are conversations about those who work in our NHS going the extra mile every single day to deliver patient care. They're stories of hope, of love and often recovery against the odds. And it's thanks to the efforts of our NHS staff at all levels using the medicines and technological advances we've been lucky enough to see that we're able to access now, that, health, that the health of our people has been in many ways completely transformed compared to 20, uh, 1948. A child born in Scotland in 1948 could expect to face a raft of illnesses, including polio, measles, whooping cough, and diphtheria. Vaccination programmes have now virtually wiped out these diseases. Child and infant mortality rates are a fraction of what they were and people are receiving treatment for cancer and surviving cancer in ways that could only be imagined by clinicians in the 1940s. This debate, I hope, today is about celebrating our NHS and its achievements and outstanding workforce. But our NHS's 70th birthday should also be a time for us to look to the future and to help put in place the long-term policies and plans that can help ensure our NHS is there, free at the point of delivery for every constituent in the decades ahead. Building a sustainable NHS needs to be a priority, I believe, for every one of us in this chamber, because our NHS faces constantly evolving new and complex challenges, 
from obesity-related conditions to an ever-increasing demand for mental health services, antibiotic resistance, the cost of new drugs and technology, and the provision of social care for an aging population as life expectancy continues to increase. And it's that life expectancy which I think we should celebrate uh, as the major achievement in our NHS. All of these massive challenges, but all, uh, all of these are massive challenges, but all of them can be addressed. And we do develop a long-term strategic thinking and policies required that will help to meet these challenges in the future, working alongside our NHS staff, who are the ones at the end of the day at the front line and who know better than any politician how to respond to the needs of patients and cope with demands placed on our health service. Deputy Presiding Officer, to conclude, great countries come together to turn challenges into opportunities. And I know our NHS staff are ready to do the very same to help transform our health and well-being of our nation. In the coming months, on these benches, we'll be putting forward our plans and vision to help take forward our Scottish NHS. I believe this parliament and every party represented in it needs to come together to help deliver that sustainable future for our Scottish NHS. But for the time being, let's celebrate the fact that our Scottish NHS is 70 years young and let's look to the future. And if we do, and if we work positively and, cooperative, and cooperatively across this parliament and chamber, I think we can be confident that the best days of our NHS lie ahead of it. Thank you. Thank you. I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Mr Sarwar, please. Deputy Speaking Officer, can I start by thanking Shona Robinson for her service as our Health Secretary in Scotland. It is no secret that the Cabinet Secretary and I it, had our disagreements. We weren't exactly the best of friends, it, but I do genuinely wish her the very best for the future. I also want to begin by congratulating my, my leader, Richard Leonard, on securing this important debate today a debate to celebrate the 70th birthday of our NHS. 70 years since the first time hospital doc hospitals, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, opticians, dentists were brought together under one umbrella to provide services for everyone, free at the point of delivery. And it's only right that it's a Labour member leading the celebration of the NHS, our NHS, Labour's NHS, Labour's greatest ever achievement and our country's most cherished public service. It is thanks to our NHS that we have all but eradicated diseases such as polio, pioneered new treatments like the world's first liver, heart and lung transplant, and every day we're treating, supporting and caring for or curing tens of thousands of our fellow citizens, free at the point of need, paid through our collective contribution and no question asked about how much money is in their pocket. Presiding officer, every single day our amazing NHS staff go above and beyond to care for others. So to all the staff right across the NHS, I want to say thank you. We all have our own personal stories and connections. Uh, to the midwives like June, who cared for my family, thank you. Uh, to the doctors like Dr. Rajan, who aided my father's recovery from his heart attack, thank you. Um, and I've got to say this, otherwise I won't be allowed back in the house tonight. To dentists like my wife, Farheen, thank you. Um, to all our NHS and social care staff, no matter what their role, thank you. Uh, but we've also got to be honest, it is a workforce that is overworked, undervalued, under-resourced, and after almost a decade of pay restraint, underpaid. So while we say thanks, our thanks is not enough. We need to support them. Presiding officer, we have debated here many times in the past few months many of the challenges facing the NHS, the 3,000 nurse and midwife vacancies, the 1 million bed days lost to delayed discharge, the 1,200 children not receiving the mental health support they need the fact that the treatment waiting time law has been broken over 100,000 times. So what we need to do in the run-up to the 70th birthday is to not just recognise the successes, but also demonstrate how we would fix some of the challenges. Because as Bevan said, the NHS will last as long as, as long as there's folk with faith left to fight for it. Well, on these benches, we have the faith to fight for it and the political will to deliver the investment needed to save it. So over the course of the celebration week, we will be making the case for what we would do differently if Labour was in government. Using our, any, using our tax system to properly fund the NHS, a credible and deliverable workforce plan, reversing the cuts to nursing and training places made by Nicola Sturgeon. A mental health counsellor in every school, crisis mental health services, protection of local services, a cancer diagnosis within two weeks, access to vital life-saving medicines, an end to cuts to social care budgets and the 15-minute care visit, access to free sport, a meaningful pay increase for NHS staff and a return to the NHS true to the vision of Nye Bevan that once again supports you from the cradle 
to the grave. So in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, if anyone ever asks why we need a Labour Party, tell them the NHS. If anyone ever asks what a Labour Party ever did for us, tell them the NHS. And if anyone ever asks what the Labour Party will ever do again, tell them the NHS. Thank you. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr Harvey, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I, as others have done, begin uh, by paying tribute to Joanna Robertson, who's stepping down as Health Secretary and wish her well for the future. Uh, can I congratulate Richard Leonard for, for bringing this motion? Uh, I don't think there's any great downside to having two motions on the, the same topic uh, in, in the one week. I, I do think it's perhaps uh, a slight pity that there wasn't uh, the, the ability to, to reconcile and, and unite behind uh, a, a single motion that would have, uh, I think, felt a little more, that would, I think, have felt a little more unified, is the only point I was, I was trying to make. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I'd like to express my support for both motions and put that uh, on the record tonight. Um, several other members have also opened their remarks by commending and thanking the very many people who work in our NHS, the dedicated and uh, often tireless, uh, because they have to be, professionals who work in our NHS and deliver those services. I have to uh, make that, that same thanks, and I, I have to echo uh, Anna Sarwar's reference to midwives in particular, because that was my mother. Uh, I, I grew up uh, with uh, a mum who uh, very often worked night shifts in the NHS, uh, and that was uh, a natural and an instinctive part of, of my understanding of what healthcare was about. I would have found it peculiar, bizarre, and incomprehensible at that young age to think that there was such a recent time, just one generation previously, when there was no such thing as an NHS. It's very easy to think of uh, history just a, a few decades before your own youth as though it's ancient history, but such a recent change, just a, a generation before mine uh, in which there wasn't an NHS. And my experience with the NHS wasn't just through seeing my mum go out to work there and, and come back uh, early in the morning as we were getting ready for school, because I was also a bit of a sicky child. Uh, and I was in and out of hospitals very often uh, with infections uh, and uh, with uh, long-term kidney damage as a result of those infections. Uh, and I became a bit of a, a human pincushion, and perhaps I may even at times have resented uh, having to go through uh, so many treatments uh, uh, within the, the services of the NHS. But now, standing here, I can reflect on the fact that I and so many, many other people wouldn't even know if we'd be able to stand here today uh, and make a contribution in a debate like this if we hadn't had access to those health services. So the, the gratitude that we all need to convey is deep uh, and profound. Richard Leonard also makes an equally profound point in saying that something of the spirit of that post-war generation needs to be recaptured. A generation uh, that, yes, was brutalised and traumatised by their wartime experience, which was economically uh, in, not in a strong place to invest, but invest they did. They said they'd fought together and survived together, and they were going to rebuild together a society that would make them better off together, not only uh, a national health service, but a welfare state. I wish to goodness that we were seeing something of that spirit uh, of, of that post-war generation in today's political climate, instead of an exercise in disaster capitalism, which I fear may be the legacy of our political generation. But if we were able to recapture that, it would mean not only paying more collectively for high-quality services that make us better off, collectively and to remunerate fairly the people who deliver those services, it would also mean taking a collective social responsibility for the determinants of ill health. Poverty, yes, as Richard Leonard mentions, the inequality in our, in our health outcomes, but also the way in which our food chain has been handed over to commercial interests, the way in which 
recreational drugs have been handed over to gangsters uh, without any ability for the state to regulate effectively. Uh, there is a huge need for us to take collective social responsibility for the things which create and worsen ill health in our society because we cannot simply rely uh, on science alone to create the conditions for health in our society. If we run an unhealthy society, we will have unhealthy outcomes. And the NHS alone, even with the greatest support we could provide it, would not be in a strong position to do the work that we need of it. Thank you. Uh, before I call Alec Cole Hamilton, can I just say that uh, due to the number of members who still wish to speak in this debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under notice, without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the rate by up to 30 minutes. And I invite Richard Leonard to move that motion, please. Uh, yes, can I move a motion to extend the debate, please, Presiding Officer? The question is, thank you, the question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. So I now call Alec Cole Hamilton. Mr Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to uh, echo thanks to Richard Leonard and the Labour Party for bringing this important motion to Parliament today. I, I will address the Cabinet Secretary's departure later in my remarks and so too echo uh, thanks of other members to uh, our hard-working NHS staff. In 1961, a prominent US actor walked into a recording studio and cut a record. I'm sure uh, many other members will have in their iPods that hot-button favourite, the spoken word classic, Ronald Reagan speaks out against socialised medicine. 11 minutes of such vignettes says, soon your son won't decide what he will do for a living. He will wait for government to tell him. Or my favourite, uh, one of the traditional methods of uh, imposing socialism on a people has been by way of medicine. It's very easy to disguise a medical problem as a humanitarian project. Most people are a little reluctant to oppose anything that suggests medical care for people who possibly can't afford it. To him and the American right wing who still support that view, I say nonsense. In 2016, 29 million people in the United States were still without medical insurance. Had I been one of them, then an operation I had 20 years ago to fix a rotator cuff muscle in my shoulder, which resulted in repeated dislocation, would have cost me $30,000. Theatre delivery of my son when my wife had complications during her, our first pregnancy would have cost $50,000 plus the resuscitation that he would have needed as well. All told, my lifetime involvement with the NHS would have cost me hundreds of thousands of pounds, but I left hospital, I've never left hospital with anything other than a dodgy shoulder fix and three beautiful children. So to the NHS, I say thank you. Parties across the chamber are right to um, remember some element that their own party had in the NHS creation because it was a cross-party creation. Good things happen when we put aside our differences and work together. It was a Labour government that brought it in, absolutely right, but it, if it, it was off the back of Conservative MP legislation. And all of that stemmed as well uh, in some of its infancy from the Beveridge Report, that great giant of liberalism. In that, he talked about those five giant evils of ignorance, idleness, squalor, want and disease. And it was this last giant evil that he envisaged the formation of a universal healthcare system, or as he described it, comprehensive rehab health and rehabilitation service for the prevention and cure of disease. How prescient is that that uh, 70 years ago, more than 70 years ago, we have people talking about prevention and, and we are still working towards that goal. We are bolstered by an amazing staff, staffing complement in our health service. People who work all days, uh, uh, hours of the day and days of the year to bring comfort and safety and security and treatment to our most vulnerable people. Our model of treatment and care in this country is sound. It is the direction of travel that is off. And I've come on to uh, the Cabinet Secretary now. I, uh, my call for her resignation is a matter of public record, but I do not revel it in it today. She is somebody that was always very kind to me, very generous of her time, and, and displayed a, a rare compassion that is uncommon in Scottish politics, and I wish her well. But certainly this government has presided over a panoply of error and misjudgment in the discharge of its responsibilities to our health service. In delayed discharge, which the former cabinet 
uh, Secretary pledged to eradicate. We still see an interruption in flow, which people are waiting as many as 600 nights after being declared fit to go home in our hospitals to get back into their communities. In service redesign without communities involvement, with mental health, this is the worst I think, where a thousand adults have waited more than a year for first line psychiatric or psychological therapies and children in some parts of this country are waiting for two more years. So let's celebrate today the creation of our much loved NHS. Let's try to strip out the party politics behind it. But that means the new cabinet secretary listening to the helpful criticism of opposition members in her discharge of her responsibilities. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr. McPherson, please. Thank you, presiding officer. I, like others have said, also welcome today's debate as a chance to speak positively and constructively about the huge achievements of our NHS at this very important anniversary. Particularly our wording in the motion around the fact that each and every day there are countless examples of the importance and success of the NHS and to thank the service staff past and present for their compassion and dedication in delivering care to people in need and wishes the NHS a happy birthday. That is the sort of sentiment that I would want us to focus on in this debate. And I say that not just because of the countless examples that I see in my very large, in terms of population, constituency of Edinburgh, Northern Leith, and different challenges that we have in such a dense urban area, but also, uh, I, wasn't, I was wondering whether to touch on this or not, but uh, Patrick Harvey has created the, opened the door for this, which is to mention my uh, and give me encouragement to do this to my family uh, connection to the NHS. My mother worked uh, for over 30 years as a geriatric physician at the forefront of the NHS here in Lothian before she retired. One of you know, the most challenging areas of our NHS in the current time. And growing up, you know, seeing that commitment, as Patrick Harvey alluded to in terms of assist mother, really uh, was part of my childhood and, and, and beyond in terms of recognising the sheer dedication that our public, service, our public servants in the NHS give on a daily basis in order to make a difference, to care for others and to try and tackle the, the, the changing scenarios and uh, factors that we have to deal with in terms of the, 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 the different pressures and the different areas of of uh, need uh, within our, our, our society uh, that bear down on the health system. And you know, it's important for us not to take the NHS for granted, as it is unique across the world in terms of its egalitarian and inclusive nature and its history. And it's important to recognize that today. And I uh, think it's good that other speakers have talked about the challenges, new and complex, and the needs and the demands that our NHS is facing. I think Miles Briggs said we need to uh, look to the future. And the motion and Richard Leonard in his, his, in his remarks talked about the need for collective responsibility. And that call to action, as I see it, is about how we preserve and make sure and enhance the NHS over the next 70 years so that it is something that we don't take for granted and something that is built upon and improved and uh, facilitated in a way to deal with the, 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 the needs that come, that come at us. And I, I would like to focus on that just in the final time I have left around us as MSPs and other politicians. You know, we all have casework to do with the health service. We all recognize its importance. And I wonder, particularly today, given Shona Robinson's uh, resignation and what she said about that, if we should use today as an opportunity also to think harder about what we can do more to collaborate. Because some of the way, and I've kind of watched from a distance on this topic, um, there's been quite a lot of grace on the topic today. But some of the ways that in which we've discussed health in this chamber have been quite ungracious, to be frank. And there's a lot of opportunism when it comes to talking about the politics of our National Health Service. So I'd say that we should all think more solution-focused. 
We should think before we press the button on the tweet or sign off the press release, will this help? Because the challenges that will face our NHS over the next 70 years and to make sure it lasts another 70 years are profound. And we could achieve so much more if we work together, as the motion said, uh, to take forward a triumphant example of the superiority of collective action and public initiative. So let's show public initiative and commit to collective and collaborative action. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr Johnson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased that Richard Leonard has brought forward this motion for debate, in part because the NHS is Labour's greatest achievement. Labour is at its best when it makes change so profound that it cannot be undone, and the NHS is one such achievement. But the main reason I'm pleased that this motion is for debate is because it allows me to do something that is important to me, which is to say thank you. Thank you on a very personal basis. Uh, my daughter, eldest daughter, was born in 2012 um, and spent the first four months of her life in the sick kids' hospital. She was born with an intestinal atresia. Within 12 hours of her birth, she was in an operating theatre uh, being operated on because an intestinal atresia is where there's a blockage that's created in the gut where, through an interruption in the blood supply. And I'll, I'll never forget those experiences in, in those first few hours, days and months. The midwives for talking me and my wife through counting the baby's movements in the womb when we were worried that it, the baby wasn't moving enough. I'll never forget holding my wife's hand in the operating theatre as she went through that emergency caesarean section. And I'll never forget the, the, some of the smallest details when I was talking to the surgeons both before and after the operation, silly things about the details of the room and what they were wearing. But I can't tell you what they said because the detail was so overwhelming, I just couldn't take it in. But I'll be forever thankful, thankful because I now have a happy six-year-old child just finishing P1 who, despite the fact she only has half the length of small intestine she's supposed to have, is the 90th centile for height uh, for her age. And I I'll be thankful that we knew from an early stage that it was only a matter of time when she was in hospital that she would get out. Thankful for the care that would have cost hundreds of thousands of pounds if we'd had to pay for it ourselves. Thanks to the surgeons, the medical teams, the nurses, especially to Mr. Munro and, and Anna, whose surname I don't know, but was the nurse who looked after her when she first got out of the operating theatre. But above all else, thank you to the NHS for getting us through that time, for providing us with the care that my family needed. And thank you to the sick kids who were wonderful. Because despite how traumatic that experience was and how difficult it was, I wouldn't change a thing. The sick kids and the NHS more broadly took what was a really stressful situation and made it one that was actually extremely rewarding. And I have to say, you know, small things like, uh, and I've mentioned it before in the chamber, being in hospital meant there were nurses on hand to tell me how to bathe my child for the first time, which would have otherwise been an incredibly nerve-wracking experience. And I have to say, I finished that thinking that if I ever got ill, I'd want to go to the sick kids because it was such a fantastic hospital. But there are some realities that lie behind that, and this is the 70th anniversary of the NHS. And in 1948, 80% of children who were born with the condition that my daughter was would have died. By the 70s, because of the advances, 80% of those children would survive because of the advances in enteral feeding, which is intravenous feeding. And now it is a small, small percentage of children. Doing. So the NHS has allowed us not just to progress in medicine, but as Richard Leonard pointed out, to ensure that we all benefit from those advances. But the other key thing, and why that experience was so positive, was down to the numbers of staff. In the sick kids, the nursing ratios are one to six. That's about twice the number of nurses that you would expect to see in an adult hospital. And I'd say this, that we do face a number of challenges. The NHS is under huge pressure because of the aging population, because we're ever more capable of doing new things, new technologies, new medical advances. But in some ways, it's the same old issues. It, it isn't a magic, it isn't kind of some complicated science. It does boil down to resource and numbers. If we want to see the care that we have always wanted to see NHS, we need to resource it. And Ben McPherson is right in a, in a sense, is that it is easy to get trapped in the small politics with the NHS, but there's also the big politics as well. 
And the one message I want to say is, yes, the NHS is under challenge, but the government also needs to step up and acknowledge those challenges and accept that it's more than just a, a strategy or a new bill or a new um, a consultation that will fix this. If we're going to tackle the big roses, we need a, a step change that we saw with the creation of the, the NHS, the step change that we saw when Labour was last in power, where we doubled the level of resource going into the NHS. If we want the NHS to continue for another 70 years, to do the amazing things that it's done for my family and families right the way across Scotland, we need to face up to those big challenges and put in the resource and the investment to make sure that we live up to those enduring principles the NHS was founded on. Thank you. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Tom Arthur. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to take part in this debate and would like to celebrate, congratulate and thank Richard Lennon for bringing forward this debate this evening. On the 5th of July 1948, the National Health Service was launched by the then Health Secretary, Nye Bevan, at the Park Hospital in Manchester. For the first time, hospitals, doctors, nurses, dentists, uh, opticians, uh, those uh, in pharmacy, all the specialists became one part uh, of a service. Uh, and that was there to be provided free of charge and really from birth to death. Uh, and that is what we still have today, 70 years on. Uh, and I think it's vitally important that, you know, the, the National Health Service has transformed the health and well-being of individuals across the United Kingdom and is envied across the world. The NHS has delivered huge medical advances and improvements in public health, which means that experts in fields across the sector are there. And why was it there? Because after the Second World War, there was a, a necessity uh, to look at health, uh, uh, to look at poverty, to look at uh, the housing that we had uh, and for individuals who'd come back from serving. Uh, and the National Health Service was an opportunity for us to celebrate and do something. And I pay tribute to all the politicians who then saw that as the, the way forward. Uh, and I thank, uh, uh, without question, all the individuals who've played their part and continue to play their part uh, in providing services the length and breadth of the country on a day-to-day -day basis, 24 hours a day. And the NHS has transformed uh, and eradicated many diseases. Polio and diphtheria were, were part of where we were. Uh, and we've had transformation uh, in lung, in health, uh, in heart, in all of these. Uh, and new techniques uh, when it comes to improving stroke. Uh, we've got individuals who've got the bionic eyes, who've re had their sight restored. Uh, we've had transplants, uh, uh, transformation. Uh, and some of that would be seen in the past as possibly science fiction, but now it's everyday use, uh, and that has been part of, of the NHS. Uh, since its conception 70 years ago, it's very much been at the forefront of, of innovation. You know, you can think back to the 1950s, the early uh, uh, 50s, when, when vaccinations were something that was not common. Uh, they introduced the polo vaccination, they introduced the depth of vaccination, and that saw the 8,000 people who had polio or 70,000 people who had depth of were being looked after. Uh, and they launched uh, the, the whole idea of, of, of modern hospitals, where a hospital plan was put in place to ensure that locations that had 125,000 individuals would have a district general hospital. Uh, and we saw uh, as I've said, transplants taking place in the late 60s. Uh, and moving into the 70s, we saw CT scans uh, and test your baby born in 1978. So all of these technology, all of these innovations have ensured that individuals uh, had the opportunity. Uh, and the, the whole idea of donor uh, recognition as well. So Deputy Presiding Officer, I pay tribute, as I say, to everyone who has participated and taken part. Uh, I have something in common with a number of, of, of members this evening uh, that my own mother uh, trained as a nurse. Uh, then became a midwife, a district nurse and a health visitor. So I grew up uh, with that environment uh, that the phone would ring in the middle of the night and my mother would go out uh, and deliver a child or, or deal with someone who was uh, uh, needing support. And for 40 years, she gave of her time and her talent to the NHS and she knew the value that that created and she knew the opportunity that that had. So as I say, I pay tribute to all those individuals who have seen that. The service does a fantastic job uh, every single day, but it comes at a cost. And if you look back, how many billions were spent 70 years ago starting the NHS? We're now dealing with tens, hundreds of billions of pounds today across the United Kingdom that we look into. It's up to all of us to ensure that we can sustain and maintain the facility. And I, I say that, that we need to ensure that the way that we all pay our fair share to ensure the NHS is retained, maintained and sustained 
for generations to come. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by John Scott. Mr Arthur, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in this debate, and I'd like to begin by thanking Richard Leonard for securing this debate. And I think it's fantastic that we do have uh, two debates this week in which we have the opportunity to express our feelings and views in the NHS, all of which are, notwithstanding the challenges that the health service faces, are universally positive. Um, just to begin, I, I want to uh, pay tribute to uh, Shona Robson, Maureen Watt and Aileen Campbell, who are leaving the health portfolio today. Um, I had a brief uh, privilege of being parliamentary liaison officer to the Cabinet Secretary of Health at the beginning of this session and saw firsthand the dedication, commitment and passion that, that um, all three of those individuals brought to their respective portfolios. And I wish them well and I, I congratulate Aileen Campbell on her um, elevation to Cabinet and wish her well in her new uh, portfolio. I also want to join with colleagues from across the Chamber in thanking our dedicated NHS staff. Um, I come from, a, from an NHS house. Both my parents worked in the health service for over 30 years. My mother started off as a, a theatre nurse, as a district nurse before retraining as a, as a mental health nurse and working uh, for over 20 years at Garden Naval Royal in what was a, a very difficult and demanding job and at a period when there was significant change in public attitudes towards mental health and how we um, as a country sought to treat and support people with mental health conditions. Similarly, my, my father worked on a different side of the NHS, a, a side that's often overlooked, and that was in estates. My father started off as an uh, electrician within the health service, um, and he worked his way up, um, and either when there was far more social mobility, perhaps, um, to become an uh, electrical engineer and before retiring as an estates manager in the health service. And that gave me a perspective. And I, I want to pay tribute to all of those people who work in the health service who perhaps we don't necessarily talk about every day. I know growing up from my father, family events being cancelled when he was on call because a, a security system had went off or a boiler had failed um, or there was a door that wouldn't open. Things that we perhaps maybe don't um, discuss enough uh, the tremendous work that those working in estates and our health service do. Um, and it's rather fitting to mention my father. My dad was, was born in 1951. That was the, the year that, and I'll use these words, that great Labour government of Atlee demitted office. And what's significant is in 1951, the average life expectancy for a woman in the UK was 72 years old and for a man was 66. Last year, that stood at 86.2 years for a woman and 83.4 years for a man. There has been a transformation in the demands that um, our health service now face. We are, to some extent, a, a victim of our own success. Infectious diseases are massively reduced, notwithstanding the challenges we still face in areas, for example, such as hepatitis C. But the real challenges we face, of course, are the non-communicable diseases, the challenges of an age, aging population. Um, and I think there's been some very important contributions um, in this debate, I think particularly from Patrick Harvey highlighting our need to think more broadly about the social determinants of ill health. And while we rightly focus on the, the services that people use, be accident emergency or CAMS, we also have to be not allow ourselves to forget the bigger picture of the social determinants of ill health. And it, simply, we cannot just think in a silo about health services, but we always have to be thinking about how housing, um, how education and how a range of, and how social security can all be used collectively holistically to make sure that we have a healthier healthier population and I, I welcome the measures that this government is taking both broadly in areas such as the national clinical strategy and the 2020 vision setting out that ambition to have acute and friendly services to deliver but also in, in our um, vision in the government's vision of achieving a, a fairer and more equal society through having a social security system that's fairness, based on fairness, dignity and respect, and also taking the measures that are necessary, be that minimum unit pricing in alcohol or the obesity strategy to be launched. So there is much work still to be done, but I just want to close where I began by thanking everyone who works in the National Health Service for the outstanding work we do. They really are uh, the best examples of people in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call John Scott, followed by Monica Lennon. Monica Lennon will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Scott, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I begin by congratulating Richard Lennon in securing this debate today and also pay tribute to Shona Robison 
who I know gave her best to our health service in her time in office and thank her for the personal help she gave me on behalf of my constituents and also welcome Jean Freeman to her new role as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport. And like others, may I also congratulate our NHS in Scotland in reaching its 70th birthday and evolving into the remarkable institution it has become. That everyone in the chamber tonight is bursting with pride and wants to say good things about our NHS is beyond doubt and with good reason. That many of us have a personal story to tell too is touching and reflects the gratitude and commitment we all feel towards our health service on the occasion of its 70th birthday. And given my age, I feel as if I've grown up alongside the health service and I have many reasons to be grateful for its existence, not least for the GP part of the service, which in my case probably saved my life on more than one occasion. Well, my first encounter with our GP service was the need for five stitches in my forehead as the result of being kicked by a cow when nine months old and calling among their feet in the buyer. My real gratitude is for the life-saving penicillin I was given to treat secondary infections caused by ringworm, again a cattle-borne problem for me as a four-year-old. And like others, I have much to be grateful to the NHS for then and since. Starting with a budget of £42 million in 1948, the budget today has grown to around £12 billion in Scotland, almost one-third of Scotland's total budget. But along the way, we have seen dramatic advances in so many areas of medicine. In 1954, Sir Richard Dole and Austin Bradford Hill identified the causal link between smoking and cancer that has led to both improved cancer treatments and the pioneering anti-smoking legislation here in Scotland. 1960s, saw so the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary pioneer kidney transplants under the guidance of Sir Michael Woodroth, while in 1972, 15 health boards were created in Scotland under the NHS Scotland Act. 1998, no, 1988, breast cancer screening was also introduced in the UK following a report by Sir Patrick Forrest of Edinburgh University, while keyhole surgery was introduced in 1989 at Nine Wells with Sir Alfred, Sir Alfred Cushery. Fast forward to 2014, and we've seen the groundbreaking development of health and social care partnerships, which takes us up to today and my local health board. And we in Ayrshire have a diligent and hard-working service in the shape of NHS Ayrshire and Arne, where in almost every case, all of the staff combine and go beyond the call of duty to deliver a constantly expanding and daily more sophisticated service. And it's good today to be able to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to our doctors and nurses and all other staff in NHS Ayrshire and Arne and across Scotland. Regrettably, and by the nature of being an MSP, and certainly in my case, by having led the campaign in Ayrshire to keep the two a &E units open there 12 years ago, we as MSPs are in a way like lightning conductors, as often we only hear about the problems and the difficulties of the NHS faced by patients and staff, when most of the time, patients and staff are delighted and proud of the outcomes achieved by our doctors and nurses. Indeed, it's easy to lose sight of the positives in much of the constant debate around the efficiency and future of the NHS, but my only ambition for our, our NHS in Ayrshire and Arran is to see it being the, the very best provider in Scotland amongst all the different health boards. Presiding officer, what is important is what has been achieved and what is still likely to be achieved, and there is a bright future for our NHS in Scotland. With additional funding promised by both Scottish and UK governments, it is possible to see how the growing future needs of our ageing population and growing life expectancy will be met. So, presiding officer, today we celebrate 70 years of better health and look forward with confidence to continuing improvement in healthcare in Scotland in the next 70 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call on Monica Lennon. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and to Richard Leonard for securing this debate, because we should take every opportunity to celebrate our NHS and especially to say thank you on the 70th anniversary. And although there's been, I think, 11 men have spoken so far and just one woman, we should remember that over three quarters of NHS staff are women. So an extra special thank you to the sisters in the NHS. Most of us hope that we never need it. 
But when we do, the NHS is always there. When I told a constituent about this debate, without prompting yesterday, she sent me a message um, about what the NHS means to her. And with her permission, I'd like to share that with you. I have squamous cell cancer in my colon. It is an unusual cancer in that area. It does not present itself with a lot of symptoms for most people. More often, it is only detected in later stages. However, my GP listened to me when I told her I had some rare occasions of slight bleeding, which worried me. That examination was done on the Wednesday and the diagnosis was confirmed the following Monday by a colonoscopy. I then had various tests, CT scans, MRI scans, PET scans, chemotherapy and radiotherapy at the Beetson. I was very well looked after by all involved in my treatment, despite the slight complication of a heart attack in the middle of it all. The very last step now is to reverse my stoma. Although the NHS have missed the anticipated date for this procedure, they have sent me a letter hoping to increase capacity in general surgery so that I may have a date for my operation soon. I owe my life to the NHS. The hardworking doctors, nurses, radiologists, oncologists, surgeon, colorectal nurses, cardiologists, anaesthetists, paramedics, and the auxiliary staff who looked after me are true heroes in my eyes. I fully support the NHS and hope we never take it for granted. I am grateful to Lanarkshire Cancer Care Trust for their services in taking me to and from my many medical appointments during my treatment. I have had a very positive experience of our NHS, but I know that there are always room for improvements. Long live the NHS and may Scottish Labour, that's us guys, always fight to keep it as one of our country's finest institutions. Happy 70th birthday, NHS. Because of you, because of you, I will see many more birthdays with my family, continue to work and contribute to society and our nation. And it's signed with a kiss from mum. And that is the story of my mum, Helen, who was diagnosed and treated for bio cancer and suffered a heart attack in the middle of it all last year. Both she and I and all of our family are so grateful for the amazing care she's received over the past year from the amazing healthcare staff in our NHS, including Dr Mary Jo Somerville from Calderstrike Medical Practice, who was on the phone, I think, a number of times, several times a week, uh, Mr R.G. Mukherjee, the surgeon at Hare Myers Hospital, Mr Tariq Abdullah, her oncologist at the Beetson, Dr Gronya Dunn, the, the medical oncologist uh, colorectal at Hare Myers, and numerous uh, nurses at the Beetson. My mum has had a phenomenal experience with the NHS. But resourcing problems in the NHS can affect us all. And it's true, my mum is still waiting to have her final operation to reverse her stoma. At the end of May, she received an apology letter from NHS Lanarkshire that her 12-week treatment time guarantee had not been met due to capacity issues in general surgery. So even the best of cases are not immune from the challenges and pressures facing our NHS. And there's no doubt that our NHS does face serious pressures. But in my mum's case, I will be forever grateful to the incredible men and women who have treated her over the past few months. As the motion says, it's right we celebrate our NHS, we should be celebrating, and it's always inc these incredible stories of success that we should be mindful of when we talk about why ensuring our NHS itself is properly cared for is so important. In conclusion, presiding officer, thank you NHS and happy 70th birthday. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Joe Fitzpatrick to close for the Government Minister. Up to seven minutes, please. Saying officer, I'm sure members will be surprised to see me closing tonight's debate. I know I am. Um, but like I'm sure every MSP, I recognise the precious value of our NHS and the skill, dedication and compassion of its staff. And I know I speak for everyone when I offer my thanks to all the staff who have worked in NHS Scotland, past and present, delivering medical advances and improvements to health and social care, meaning that more people can expect to live longer, healthier lives. 
And although um, there was, of course, a good splattering of politics in tonight's debate, there was also a common thread of gratitude to all NHS staff, which transcended across the party lines. I'm sure you will understand if I also offer my thanks for the service of my friend Shona Robison to our NHS and care services. Over almost four years as Health Secretary, she fought for our health services and I know just how happy she was when this week she was able to offer our NHS Agenda for Change staff a pay rise of at least 9% over the next three years. And I want to add my, my thanks to Miles Briggs, Anna Sarwar, Patrick Harvey, Tom Arthur, John Scott and Ben Mc McPherson for your good wishes and, and warm words. Thank you. Scotland has made an immense contribution to the development of the NHS. Indeed, before there was an NHS, the Highlands and Islands Medical Service was established in 1913 as a state-funded health service. This, provided highly, this proved highly successful. By 1929, there were 175 nurses and 160 doctors working in 150 practices. By 1935, an air ambulance service was available to transport patients to specialist mainland hospitals. The Highlands and Islands Medical Service was a remarkable achievement for its time. It's seen by professionals as having an important influence on the development of the National Health Service. It was a model of state-funded care that clearly delivered improved health in the communities that it served. After the establishment of the NHS, Scotland continued to pioneer medical treatment and, have, and that have saved countless lives. In 1958, Glasgow produced the first practical ultrasound scanner, which in modern form continues to save lives across the globe. In 1960, the first successful kidney transplantation in the UK was per performed by a team in, in, in Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. And in 1980, the world's first clinical service for MRI was performed at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. In 1989, the UK's first use of keyhole surgery to remove a patient's gallbladder was un undertaken um, at Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee in my constituency. The Highlands and Islands, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Dundee. These are only some examples. Health and care staff across the whole of Scotland have led innovation and treatments that have made our NHS admired and emulated across the world. This is still the case today. This government is working with NHS staff and many other partners to introduce world-leading solutions to improve health and social care. We launched the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, the first national approach to improve patient safety. Profe Professor Donald Berwick, um, former advisor to President Obama, has been quoted as saying, the reality is that Scotland is the internationally leading success story of the healthcare safety improvement. Other nations have made progress, but not to the degree of comprehensiveness and, I think, scientific discipline that Scotland has. We became the first country in the world to implement minimum unit pricing for alcohol. We took this bold decision and stuck to it despite the many obstacles placed in our way because we are determined to tackle Scotland's unhealthy relationship with alcohol. We're f yes. Patrick Harvey. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the, the Minister for for giving away, and he, he moves on to a public health issue. Would he agree that if we're going to have a successful health service for the long-term future, and if we're going to have a healthy population, we need to face up to the reality that most developed societies have been more successful at extending lifespans than we have been at extending the healthy, active part of life and that it's not just the ministers with direct responsibility for the NHS, but government right across the spectrum that needs to take responsibility for a transformation in public health if we're going to see the outcomes that we all want. Minister. I think Patrick Harvey makes a very good, good point. In terms of dealing with just about any aspect of government, we need to look across across the whole of government to look at how we can make those differences to outcomes and that's very much the approach that has been instilled in our, na our national performance framework about how we can join things up and, and make the difference to the, the actual outcomes um, in people's lives and in his right to say that it's not just the extension the quality the, and, and uh, of, of life is, is important too so we need to be careful that we're in looking at outcomes we're looking at we're measuring the correct outcomes and the ones that will make a difference so he makes a very good good point we're which I was actually just coming to, so I'll skip over that piece. Um, 
So, um, so in continuing to, to move um, our public health priorities forward, um, we've jointly published with COSLA our public health priorities for Scotland, and I think it this touches on some of the points that Patrick Harvey was making. So our new priorities focus on place and community, early years, men mental well-being, reducing the harms associated with alcohol, tobacco and other drugs, reducing poverty and inequality and healthy weight and physical activity. The priorities have been developed in collaboration and broadly in, endorsed by a wide range of organisations and professional groups. So it's not just across government we need to work together, but clearly it's, a, it's a, across society. So th this reassures me that our message about the collective effort of society as a whole and the importance of empowering communities is being heard and is resonating with people. We've already made progress with the publication of an action plan on tobacco, and this um, will be followed by strategies and plans in the coming weeks and months on physical activity, mental health, diet and healthy weight, and substance use. Collective action and public um, initiative is the driving force that enables our NHS to care for us all, to care for the mother delivering her, her first baby, to care for those suffering from illness and accident in communities across Scotland, to care for our elderly and ensure that they live a healthy and fulfilling life as long as possible. The NHS has been caring for us for 70 years and will do so long into the future. I again thank all our health and care staff, past, present, past and present, for their, for their work. They can take pride in their achievements, past and present, and have given us this tr a tremendous gift for the future. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.